She's driven by the power. She's driven to get the power. That is the driving force in her life. She does not answer questions uh, straight out. She is the expert of not saying what she believes. She will run on attacking Republicans and and being the first woman president. And oh, isn't that amazing? Oh, it's a woman. She can walk and talk. The thought here is it's all politics. Parcel out favors to individual groups, whether it's unions here or the farm block there. She is steeped in controversy, steeped in sleaze. That's why they don't want us to look at her record. I would recommend that Hillary Clinton appreciate that she's not going to be, by any means, the candidate of American women. American women have diverse views on politics, just like men. At the core of almost every one of the investigations we did for eight years, uh, where there were problems, and I mean major problems, with the Clinton administration, she was at the core of them. It's part of the Clinton method, which is say what you need to say at, at any given moment and rely on the lack of memory of the American public and the support of the mainstream media to support that lack of memory. Well, the 20-year plan really is that the Clintons share power. Now, one would be president in eight years, and one would be president in another eight years, over a span of 20 years, with a little uh, Republican in between, perhaps. So, in essence, what happened is that Bill and Hillary, in their mid-twenties, before they ever took their marital vows, they took their political vows. You know, a lot of people ask me, do we have to go through all these old Clinton scandals again? Well, I have good news for you. You don't, because you can look at the new ones, because Hillary Clinton scandals are a gift that keeps on giving. Ruthless, vindictive, mendacious, venal, sneaky, ideological, intolerant, liar is a good one, scares the hell out of me, looks good in a pantsuit. today that I'm forming a presidential exploratory committee. I'm not just starting a campaign though, I'm beginning a conversation with you, with America. So let's talk, let's chat, let's start a dialogue about your ideas and mine. And while I can't visit everyone's living room, I can try. So let the conversation begin. I have a feeling it's going to be very interesting. The challenge for Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail is she has to pretend to be something she's not. She's far more liberal than she's going to want to let on. That means you have to be very controlled. You can't be too spontaneous. You're pretending to be something. And I think that's going to be a potential problem for her on a couple of grounds. It's inauthentic, and people spot that. I am sick and tired of people who say that if you debate and you disagree with this administration, somehow you're not patriotic. And we should stand up and say, we are Americans and we have a right to debate and disagree with any administration. She's a person who's struggling herself with figuring out who she is, or more importantly, how she wants to present herself to the American public because her own advisors told us her sort of authenticity and who she is is issue one, issue two, and issue three for her. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. She's continually trying to redefine herself and figure out who she is and project an authenticity to voters who are, of course, wondering who is the real Hillary. Hillary Rodham Clinton. Could she become the first female president in the history of the United States? Her name is known by nearly every American, but who she really is remains largely a mystery. Hillary Clinton points to her time in the White House as a large part of her qualification for the job as president. But most of the news media has conveniently forgotten that her time as first lady was mired in controversy. The core of the controversy is how truthful Mrs. Clinton has been in answering questions, sometimes under oath, about Whitewater and other matters. She was the first First Lady to come under criminal investigation. 
In both Little Rock and Washington, D.C., she was plagued by numerous scandals. Uh, Senator Clinton has extraordinary ability to obfuscate, uh, refuse to answer questions, avoid uh, confrontations, and uh, up until now has been given a pass on it. A story in the New York Times talking about why Senator Clinton voted this way, because I think some people were surprised by it. And her advisor said that she voted yes because she was moving from primary mode to general election mode. Primary mode versus general election mode? How about tell the truth mode? How about we say the same thing in the primary that we say in the general election? We know that Hillary's an insecure person. Secure people don't lie. They don't lie inveterately the way she does. What drives Hillary now is power. She very much is interested in gaining power. She considers herself to be a special person. She has a lot of arrogance, a spirit of superiority about her. And this is the driving force in her life, is to gain and acquire and maintain power. And her husband got to the top, and see, she saw it, she felt it, and she wants there herself. Over the past 16 years, Hillary Clinton has undoubtedly become one of the most divisive figures in America. How this makes her suited to unite the country as the next president is troubling to many. And recall Hillary speaking at a black church on Martin Luther King Day. What a coincidence. When you look at the way the House of Representatives has been run, it has been run like a plantation, and you know what I'm talking about. And you know what I'm talking about, girlfriend. That's how she's going to get to power? by accusing the Republicans of running a plantation at a black church on Martin Luther King Day. That's it. Okay. After announcing her bid for the presidency, fellow Democrats, including former Clinton confidant and Hollywood mogul David Geffen, publicly questioned Hillary's integrity and truthfulness. Such breaks within the Clinton inner circle beg the question, what is the truth about Hillary Rodham Clinton? It's a recklessness that's born of arrogance that goes back to her 1960s roots in their narcissism. They believe they are a rule unto themselves. I mean, every time Hillary's been caught in a scandal, she really did it. No one made it up. She's deceitful. She'll make up any story, lie about anything, as long as it serves her purpose of the moment. And uh, the American people are going to catch on to it. So who is the real Hillary Clinton? Is she a brilliant trailblazer poised to make history as the first female president? Or is she ruthless, cunning, dishonest, willing to do anything for power? Because of your position or your husband's, might have given you some kind of unfavorable or, you know, uh, a favored advantage? There isn't any evidence that anybody gave me any favorable treatment. <laughs> yes. Yeah, one question I'd like to follow up to. First one has to do with Susan McDougall. She said that she brought the documents of Whitewater over to you at the governor's mansion. Did you receive all the documents? And if so, what became of them? Every document that we have obtained has been turned over to the special counsel, no matter where it came from. Mrs. Clinton, um, can you tell us what you know about um, stories about shredding of Whitewater documents down in Arkansas? Nothing. At um, the gubernatorial mansion? Oh, that didn't happen, and I know nothing about any other such stories. Nothing about documents relating to Whitewater ever shredded anywhere that you know about or authorized or didn't authorize? Absolutely not. When you look at all the skullduggery in the Clinton administration, all roads lead back to Hillary. It also tells us something about the character of, of the American media. I mean, they, 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 they carry these people. A Republican with that with those numbers of character flaws, with that sort of behavioral problem and, and, and psychopathic psychology could not run or be elected to dog catcher if it were a Republican. The politics of personal destruction was a phrase popularized by the Clintons in the 90s to describe the attacks by what Hillary called the vast right-wing conspiracy. But, is she actually more familiar with practicing that fine art 
than being its victim. They have been the masters of the politics of personal destruction, and then they use the well-known trick of accusing your opponents of your own malfeasance. So they accuse conservatives of speaking honestly about the ethical shortcomings of the Clintons, while they, in fact, speak dishonestly about the integrity of their opponents. And that has been a bellwether, and it has done destruction to people who they've encountered. Even people in the Democratic Party would acknowledge the Clintons are particularly ruthless and particularly aggressive when it comes to campaigns. They war room. This is a military metaphor for the campaign the Clintons invented regarding instant responses, that no matter what the validity of a charge, you don't explain the charge, you don't apologize for the charge, you don't admit any error, you automatically attack the integrity or the motivations of the other side. There are any number of things in the Clinton's political history that is worth recalling before you go in to vote for, potentially, for a Clinton, in this case, a Hillary Clinton. And it's a small example, but a telling one. When they turned on the travel office, where you had career civil servants doing a great job providing the travel service for the president and his staff, and they wanted to get a, a lackey friend in, they could have fired the guy in charge, but they accused him of a crime. They tried to ruin his, his life in order order to be able to get them out and get their lackeys in. When the Clintons moved to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in 1993, White House veteran Billy Dale was the director of the travel office. Dale had faithfully served seven previous presidents, starting with John F. Kennedy in 1961. But Dale, who had actually voted for Clinton for president, would soon discover that business under the Clintons would not be business as usual. We knew that we were in for a rougher transition because we had heard stories from Secret Service agents who had gone to Little Rock for a two-week stay down there. And the stories that some of the agents would come back and tell us that we just knew that it was going to be different. We didn't realize how different it was going to be. The new administration is free to fire anybody that they want to, but traditionally that does not happen. On the day of Clinton's inauguration, Wednesday, January 20th, 1993, Billy Dale got a call from an unknown woman indicating that Catherine Cornelius, the 24-year-old third cousin of President Clinton, would soon be working in the travel office. When I got to know who Catherine Cornelius was, she went to work in David Watkins' office answering phones, but she never let up in her demands to take over the travel office. In the meantime, I get a telephone call from a gentleman in Ohio, and he wants to know how he can get in on some of the White House charter business. And I said, that's what I do. I arranged the charters, and he said, I don't know, but he says, we can make some money here. If I had made arrangements with that gentleman, I speculate that things would have been very different than as they turned out. That call was from Darnell Martins, a partner of Clinton's close friends and Hollywood producers, Harry and Linda Bloodworth Thomason, in a travel agency called TRM. When Congress investigated, they learned Harry Thomason had multiple conversations with First Lady Hillary Clinton about taking over the White House charters. At that time, I didn't even know who Harry Thomason was, but we have since learned that Catherine was reporting to him and he was reporting to the First Lady Hillary Clinton. As Dale says, every new president has the right to hire new travel office staff even though no president had done so for over 30 years. But not only was Billy Dale fired, along with six other travel office staff members, he was also locked out of his office. But that was only the beginning. And I got accused of embezzling $14,000 that I couldn't account for because the logs were missing. At the same time, D.D. Myers is in the press room briefing the White House press corps, telling them that we were being fired for criminal misconduct and the FBI was being called in to conduct a criminal investigation. I think that they wanted to make it look like they were doing it because it was corruption over there so nobody would criticize them because the media liked Billy Dale and the people there. Gary Aldrich was an FBI agent for 26 years, the last five as an agent responsible for background checks on White House staff. Recall that the FBI had conducted investigations of all of these men 
and had determined that they were qualified to work in the White House and that they were honest individuals. I conducted some of those investigations. Billy Dale was humiliated and was accused of serious wrongdoing to the degree that they conduct a federal grand jury investigation and an indictment of him. I had dedicated 32 years of my life to this job and served faithfully to Democrats and Republicans alike. The experience was a major event in my career because it taught me that powerful politicians can misuse law enforcement authority almost whimsically. And because it was the first lady ordering the investigation, well then, charges have to be found. That scared me. That was different from my experience in the FBI of 26 years. I thought, if we have reached the level where a politician can get irritated with somebody and cause them to maybe end up in federal prison, we've got a serious problem. The White House Travel Office affair became known as Travelgate. When Dale's legal bills to defend himself were estimated to run as much as $750,000, he considered a plea deal, a fine of $69,000 and a brief jail sentence. Blanche and I had been married for 38 years at that time. I decided that I would have to sell my home. Could I ask her to give up everything that we had worked for? The plea bargain seemed just that a bargain in order to save himself and his family from the unending ordeal. But when Dale was informed he would not be able to proclaim his innocence, he realized he couldn't bargain with the truth. In the meantime, during this year, I got a notice from the IRS that I was being audited. For the next 30 months, Dale was investigated. His son and daughter were also subpoenaed. I remember Vicki, our oldest daughter, telling her mother that if I was found guilty, and maybe we better start over. If you were sent to jail, or something you'd <laughs> I remember during my trial, Vicki, my oldest daughter, telling her mother that if I was found guilty and had to go to jail for something that I did not do, that she didn't know if she could live in this country any longer when the, the, the government would be responsible for doing something like that to her father. When the case went to trial in the fall of 1995, a procession of White House journalists volunteered to serve as character witnesses for Dale, including Britt Hume and Sam Donaldson. The press at the time, I think, ought to remind people that I testified at Billy Dale's trial as a character witness for him. The jury needed less than two hours to reach a verdict. And the jury came in and they found me not guilty on all counts. I laid my head down on the desk in front of me and cried. Ultimately, the Office of the Independent Counsel's final report on the travel office firings found that Mrs. Clinton's sworn testimony was factually inaccurate. Hillary Clinton was more powerful as a first lady than any first lady that had been in the White House that I knew of. Until I have learned that she was involved with it more than Bill was. Bill just wiped his hands of it and just would let her handle it. That's an example of the cynicism and the ruthlessness of the Clintons. And at the time, I think a lot of people thought that Hillary had at least as much to do with that as Bill did. What she did to the travel office, I mean, in a way, that is the most illustrative scandal um, because it was such an Avita Peron. Um, act of maliciousness toward toward these ordinary people. This guy running the travel office all these years, I'm getting them out, getting my rich Hollywood friends in. It's not even it's not even the most the most illegal thing they did, but it is the most contemptible thing they did. Billy Dale wasn't the only victim of what some would allege to be Hillary Clinton's brutal and corrupt political machine. I would say the most important thing I would study 
is her conduct as First Lady, not as Senator. And the, uh, her lack of uh, sensitivity to civil liberties, of privacy, using the Internal Revenue Service, her hostility to opponents, her hardness, her meanness. The Clinton administration, almost from its first day, started using the, uh, uh, the IRS as a threat. I know a lot of tax lawyers, and they said the odds of someone like Paula Jones with her income being audited by the R IRS um, is like being struck by lightning twice. Others would claim that using the IRS to harass political enemies was a Clinton White House specialty, one reminiscent of the strong arm of Richard Nixon. They're both very smart, very politically ruthless, very hardworking, great work habits. Uh, some of them not complimentary, very cynical, uh, willing to do things uh, that are beyond the pale of, of proper conduct. Proper conduct would not include using private investigators to intimidate. Those allegations come from several women involved with Bill Clinton, including Jennifer Flowers, Elizabeth Ward Grayson, Paula Jones, and Kathleen Willey. The scare tactics, you know, being followed, being audited by the IRS, their homes broken into. I mean, where does it end? Clinton supporter and campaign worker Kathleen Willey was a White House volunteer who alleges that President Clinton sexually assaulted her during a meeting in the private study off the Oval Office in November of 1993. I kept thinking to myself, what in the hell is he doing? I, I just, that's what I kept thinking. And, which sounds silly at the time, but I, I, was, I was getting embarrassed for him. If that does, it's just, you know, this is just not proper. You have to remember, this was at the time when there was a lot of speculation about us womanizing, and I was the loyal Democrat, and I would not allow myself to believe that that was true. I just, I just thought it was all just rumor. Willie believes that Hillary Clinton was well aware of the tactics used by the Clinton White House to intimidate perceived enemies. Willie says two days before she was set to testify against President Clinton in the Paula Jones sexual harassment case, a stranger confronted her. We passed and he stopped and he said, hey Kathleen, did you ever find your cat? And then he said, rather ominously, um, yeah, that bullseye was a really nice cat. And that's what I thought, that something else was going on here. He stood back and he said, you're just not getting the message, are you? The Clinton attack machine immediately targeted Willie. However, there are corroborating witnesses. Jared Stern, a former Marine, later told congressional investigators he was hired to investigate Kathleen Willey during a clandestine nighttime meeting. It was late at night. He called me, asked me to meet him here in this parking garage. I met him, said he had something very important to discuss. I talked to him about it, uh, discussed the tasking, and then I left to carry it out. Stern declines to discuss what he was hired to do. But Stern has admitted he was so uneasy about it that he called Willie, using an alias. I made a telephone call to Miss Willie. I left a message on her answering service indicating that I'd try again the next day. And he left a message for me saying, be careful that there were people out to get me. Jared Stern is a first-hand witness to what the, the Clintons are doing, have done, and are doing to these women. The Clintons are a unit. They share a zeal for power and a willingness to engage in any and all threat neutralizing strategies. Legality be damned. No one will ever say what happened to Kathleen Willey was an anomaly. That MO can be seen throughout the Clintons' political lives. It is consistent. Willey says her car was vandalized, her house broken into, and a cat's skull was left on her porch. Today, she still lives in fear. And I don't understand how any woman in this country could vote for a woman who does that to other people, who sets out to destroy and ruin the, these women who have crossed paths with Bill Clinton. They're power hungry. They stop at nothing. They stop at nothing. If you put me to work for you, I'll work to lift people up not push them down. I finally parted company with Hillary Clinton when I saw how she was using private detectives to investigate the women who were linked to her husband. Not to change him, 
not to reform him, not to make him a better person, but to cow the women into silence so that he could get elected president. I do not want that woman controlling the IRS or the DEA or the NSA or the FBI or the CIA. Not in a democracy, I don't. I mean, think of what it says about, about Hillary Clinton, that she was willing to put up with with his open philandering, with, with anything in a skirt who wanders before his eyesight, all for the power. Um, at least with Bill Clinton, he was just, you know, good time Charlie. Hillary's got an agenda, and she's willing to put up with that to, to be president of the United States. She, she's got a to-do list when she gets to the White House. Hillary Clinton's Machiavellian behavior, her tendency to manipulate, deceive, and destroy for personal gain is nothing new. This woman, now a hero to feminists, gained much of her power during the Clinton presidency from her ability to deal with her husband's infidelities. Bill was always heavily involved in the policies of his administration, but he left chasing down his women and silencing them, pursuing the scandals and lying about them, escaping culpability for any of the things in their past to Hillary. She was his Nixon. She was his evil equivalent. She was the one who made sure that nothing got to him uh, because she was so good at it. And she was. Hillary's mastery of the black arts of attack politics is often skillfully cloaked in layers of deniability. But when she needs money, as all candidates do, her imprudence bewilders even her most loyal supporters. The pattern is a familiar one. Huge amounts of money are raised from political insiders, lobbyists, and special interest groups, and questions follow. In the summer of 2007, Hillary was forced to return nearly $900,000 from fundraiser Norman Shu, who is now under indictment for running a Ponzi scheme. During the White House years, it was the dirty money of a cast of characters that included Johnny Chung, and Charlie Tree, both convicted of illegal campaign fundraising. I think it was Johnny Chung that said the White House was like a subway turnstile. You put the money in and you got in. And if his tokens were very large, of course. Um, there's evidence that he collected money from a Chinese intelligence officer and they were trying to influence our elections to gain access to decision-making uh, powers in the United States so they would bend U.S. policy towards China. The campaign finance scandals were so extensive, 120 people either fled the country to avoid being in interrogated by investigators, pled the Fifth Amendment, or otherwise avoided questions. 14 guilty pleas came out of that. This is really stunning. Um, and it's stunning to me how the media will give her a pass and how the media pretends none of these things happen. And they accept the, the Hillary uh, operative's line, which is, well, that's, that's, that's old news. Everybody knows about it. Let's move on. Okay, we move on. Now they're laundering money through Chinese dishwashers in Chinatown in New York. I'm a little surprised somebody in the campaign didn't flag that down and say, uh, dishwashers, maximum contribution or $1,000? Um, let's look into that a little bit. Uh, the Los Angeles Times looked into it and found that they couldn't find something like a third of these uh, Chinatown contributors and that they found other people who uh, said they had no idea that they had made contributions. It looks like a clear case that somebody committed fundraising law violations, and the Clinton campaign at the least did not do due diligence to try and track that down. One case in particular highlights Hillary's hypocrisy and startling recklessness when it comes to raising illegal campaign contributions. Though most of the news media has ignored it, Hillary was directly involved in what has been called the biggest campaign finance fraud in the history of the United States. It is a story with all the elements of a bestseller, cash, cons, and Hollywood stars. And it was all caught on tape. Few businessmen have seen the career heights and depths of Peter F. Paul. I've been fortunate to spend time with some of the world's most celebrated figures of the 20th century. One of my idols was Salvador Dali. He had a big influence on the way that I directed my life. In the early 1980s, Paul, a Miami lawyer with a past criminal record, including convictions for cocaine possession and fraud, 
headed to Hollywood for a fresh start as a promoter and producer. After doing various projects in Hollywood, I decided after meeting a fellow who was a uh, out of work uh, model that uh, there was an opportunity for me to prove that I could cultivate a media icon. Within 18 months, I had him on the cover of People magazine. Ultimately, it led to my first meeting with the Clintons, with Hillary Clinton, actually. In February of 2000, Peter Paul met with Hollywood charity fundraiser Aaron Tonkin. Tonkin was a celebrity-obsessed con man who, in just a few years, went from being homeless to one of the Clintons' top money contacts in Hollywood. Like more than a few Clinton associates from the past, Tonkin ended up in federal prison for unrelated fundraising scams. Aaron, it's Hillary Clinton. I just wanted to call and wish you well for this evening. It was a growing new relationship. I don't know where it ultimately would lead, but I suppose not in a good place because all the people that I met around them, that I dealt with in different events, have all gone to prison. And these are very close people, mainly to the president. Through Tonkin's connections to the Clintons came an interesting offer. In exchange for donations to Hillary's 2000 Senate campaign, Paul would gain access to Bill Clinton for business opportunities once Clinton left the White House. I had uh, become a very close friend of, of the creator of Spider-Man, Stan Lee, and we had started a company together in uh, late 1998. So I embarked on this effort to try to hire Bill Clinton when he left the White House as a rainmaker for the company, Stan Lee Media. We had a, a luncheon at a spa goats for 12 people who were influential in the community, and we also raised some money for Hillary. And at that point, I indicated that my plans were to hire Bill when he left the White House. She responded by saying that she would help if I became a major supporter of her campaign. In June of 2000, Paul agreed to finance what would be the largest and most lavish political fundraiser ever staged in Hollywood. It consisted of a concert, a dinner, and a reception. In my office on July 17th, I got a phone call from Hillary Clinton Paul, who had a habit of videotaping many of his encounters with Hollywood or DC power players, says this tape is evidence of two criminal offenses committed by Senator Hillary Clinton. The tape seems to indicate Clinton's participation in the planning of the event, violating federal election statutes. I think that uh, whatever it is you're doing, I, is it okay that I thank you? <laughs> I think it's tremendous. No, we know what, we're having a good time trying to help out. Well, I, I'm very appreciative. It sounds fabulous. I got a full report from Kelly uh, today when she when got When Hillary there. says she's not sure about what she can or cannot say, is she admitting that her input on the event could be illegal? I think that uh, whatever it is you're doing, I, is it okay that I thank you? Hillary Clinton refers to Kelly. Kelly is Kelly Craighead, Hillary's senior staff assistant at the White House. Hillary's confirmation that she had been fully briefed on my progress and that she would be involved on a personal basis whenever needed, committing a violation of the federal election law. I know I talked with Chair and uh, you know, she was just great, just said, you know, she really was excited and I hadn't talked to her, so you had to have really done a good job selling it to her. And her reference to Cher being induced to contribute her singing services, all of them colluded to hide this from every investigation. All of the expenses that I paid for entertainment and costs of various fundraisers for Hillary were never legally reported. But what I discovered was because Hillary was involved directly, personally, and indirectly through her agent, Kelly Craighead, in conceiving the event, in soliciting the money to pay for the event, and then coordinating the expenditures for the event, clearly the two of them were violating federal law. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of Stanley Media, Stanley. I just want to welcome you all to the Hollywood salute to President William Jefferson Clinton. It was the biggest event ever produced in Hollywood for a president. Muhammad Ali, John Travolta, Brad Pitt, Shirley MacLaine, the Steenbergen, Gregory Peck, Cher, Diana Ross, Patti LaBelle, Tony Braxton, Melissa Etheridge, Sugar Ray, Michael Bolton, Paul Anka. We had over a hundred 
stars, the entire leadership of the Democratic Party was there. And it was, it was a magical evening. But just two days later, the magic was gone. The Monday after the event, I got a phone call from Ed Rendell telling me that the Washington Post was asking questions. The position that Hillary Clinton would take was that she hardly knew me and that I didn't give any money and that if I was smart in order to maintain my deal that I would go along with that. The Washington Post bombshell questioned Hillary's decision to associate with Paul, given his criminal past. The Clinton camp implied they weren't aware of it. I had been vetted six times. My house had been prepared for a presidential sleepover. And the president allowed me to put my name on 25,000 invitations. It's impossible to think that they didn't know that I had federal convictions, which anybody that uses the internet can find with, within four clicks. Peter Paul was basically paying for the entire event, and he was held at arm's length. He wasn't invited to the White House, and they did not really want to interact with him. And I, it never really dawned on me, because I, I really didn't understand those part of politics and how it works, that they do a vetting process. Amazingly, the Clintons continued to solicit money from Paul, even after publicly distancing themselves from their newfound friend. On August 24th, a fax was sent to my office on Hillary's letterhead, the Hillary Clinton for Senate letterhead by her finance director, David Rosen, asking me to transfer $100,000 in stock. And here you have a smoking gun document, which is on her letterhead, faxed to my controller with the wiring instructions to send $100,000 worth of stock. That's illegal. When I became Hillary's biggest donor, no one made any reference to concerns about my credibility, my truthfulness, or my, my ability to honestly do business. You know, Hillary has no problems with me as long as I'm writing checks. From there, the Paul case takes twists and turns no screenwriter could imagine. Stanley Media collapses. Paul is indicted on two felonies in connection with trading of Stanley Media stock. He's arrested in Brazil by Interpol and languishes two and a half years in a Brazilian hellhole of a prison awaiting extradition. She's never called me a liar, and she's never said that my allegations are false. What she has sworn to is that she can't remember some conversations that we had in detail. I'm not asking anybody to like me or to trust me or even to believe me. I'm asking people to look at the record that is undisputed and to come to their own conclusions regarding the suitability of Hillary Clinton to acquire the highest office in this country. June 9, 2000, did you discuss with Hillary Clinton supporting her campaign in exchange for President Clinton helping you in your business and concerns? Yes. Did Hillary Clinton pledge President Clinton's support for your business interests? Yes. August 13, 2000, at Barbara Streisand's home, did you talk with Hillary Clinton about supporting her campaign, provided President Clinton help you with your business interests? Yes. I've been analyzing polygraphs since uh, 1995. I attended the Department of Defense Polygraph Institute I would say Mr. Paul has been truthful in his answering the questions concerning the issues administered in the polygraph. It was the most lavish affair of all, but her campaign said that it cost 400,000, not 1.1 million, so that they could use the other 700,000 for the campaign and use it to buy advertisements. Now the question is, did Hillary know it was a mistake? Of course she did. Number one, she was there and she knew it couldn't have only cost 400. Number two, she frequently urged Peter Paul to hold down the expenditures for it. Number three, after the forms were filed with the FEC, Peter Paul told her they were inaccurate and Hillary continued to file inaccurate forms. And finally, the FEC investigated it and concluded it did cost 1.1 million. I want to thank Stan Lee and Peter Paul and Aaron Tonkin for their extraordinary hard work and leadership on this. The Clinton campaign ultimately paid $35,000 in fines for having underreported the cost of the gala. 
Aaron Tonkin says both Senator Clinton and her finance director David Rosen knew of his illegal financing schemes, including how he reimbursed celebrities who donated to Hillary's Senate campaign. They wrote a check where I told them to write it, the Senate 2000, from the invitation they received, and then I reimbursed them either one or two thousand, depending if one or two people came. I told her national finance director David Rosen, and he just said, don't tell me anything like that. And um, I told the um, FBI. Is it possible that the senator from New York and former first lady, the most experienced of all the candidates, was completely unaware of her finance director's dealings. Peter Paul awaits sentencing for securities fraud. He vows to spend the rest of his life trying to expose what he characterizes as Hillary's chronic pattern of corruption. Well, I think that like William Sapphire said in the New York Times, Hillary's a congenital liar. Even David Geffen, who was a supporter of hers, uh, commented on her facility with lying. If she can do this as publicly and in such a, a, a gross and unvarnished way, then imagine if she got additional power in the White House and what she would do with that. I can't think of any other politician in history who has shown such a disrespect and a contempt for the Constitution and the rule of law as Hillary. And, and I represented Richard Nixon's best friend and uh, I knew Richard Nixon. And I'll tell you something, she's no Richard Nixon, she's worse. <laughs> One of her great claims um, throughout the 90s and in her present career as, sen as senator is that she'll say, oh, this is all old news. Well, it's old news because the Clintons are repeat offenders. They've been doing these things going right back to the 1980s. As a senator, Hillary Clinton has basically done nothing of note. Uh, she's not been a leader in national security. She's not been a leader on economic issues. She's not been a leader on anything. Is Hillary really the most qualified to hit the ground running if elected president? After all, she was first lady for eight years and now a senator from New York. Referring to her opponents, she said, quote, There is one job we can't afford on the job training for. That is the job of our next president. First lady ever to be the first woman from the state of New York, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Hillary says we should elect her president because of her tremendous accomplishments in the United States Senate. Well, she's passed roughly 20 bills. Let me tell you what some of them were. To commemorate the 225th anniversary of the American Revolution, to express our appreciation to Alexander Hamilton, to name the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse in Lower Manhattan, to honor the men's and the women's lacrosse high school team from Syracuse High School, to express the sense of Congress that Harriet Tubman, who died over 100 years ago, should have received a federal pension. But is that the legislative gravitas and qualifications on which to elect a president of the United States? Is she kidding? During her Senate campaign, Hillary promised to create 200,000 jobs, largely to benefit economically depressed upstate New York. And if you help me get elected, I'll work day and night to put this plan in effect for the people and children of New York. I'm Marshall Brown. I'm the owner-operator at GMB Farm. I grew up here with my father. But we sold out in 1985, and I started back up in 1987. I milk cows every day of my life for 20 years. Agriculture is New York State's largest industry. I don't know if Hillary was told that when she got off the plane or not. Dairy farming is the largest segment of that. Three years ago, Hillary Clinton came to Oswego County. She said she had a plan for the dairy industry. Like all her plans, she never gives any specifics, but it's gonna make everything all wonderful for us. Two years after she gave her I Got a Plan speech, the price of milk dropped to the same level it was in 1979, and I'm losing my ass. Senator Clinton's promise of 200,000 jobs for upstate New York was one of the most irresponsible statements she ever made. Because A, it proved to me that she had no clue of what was wrong with upstate New York, and B, there's no way the federal government can deliver that. Should she have made the promise? Oh, sure. That's what politicians do. That's what God put them on the earth to do, is make promises they can't keep. I don't fault her for making the promise. 
I fault her for making bad votes in the Senate against the very tax cuts that would have helped the state of New York. Now, the Bush tax cuts were the only hope upstate New York had of competing, and if New York State wasn't so burdened by heavy taxes, heavy unionism, heavy regulatory red tape, upstate New York would be doing dramatically better. Because I do have a plan. I have an economic plan for upstate New York to try to make sure that we keep our young people here, that they can have jobs in this area, they can stay and raise their children. Between 2000 and 2006, over one million New Yorkers moved out of the state for economic or financial reasons. Today, in the upstate town of Clinton, New York, many of Hillary's constituents aren't pleased with their senator. Well, we certainly would like more support from her in this area. I think every business would like to see more economic support. I think that uh, she's just a typical politician. Whatever the uh, survey shows she should be doing, she's doing. She tends to spend most of her time downstate. That's where the votes are primarily, and uh, sometimes we feel forgotten up here. She cares more about her consumers, her food stamps, her welfare programs, than she does the, the American farmer that's producing the food. When the American farmer is eligible for food stamps, there's a problem. Which I am. As a presidential candidate, Hillary has made other promises that may also prove difficult to keep. My plan does not create a single new government department, agency, or bureaucracy. It is not a government takeover of health care. It is a public-private partnership that provides more choices. Her sweeping health care reform proposal comes with a price tag of nearly $110 billion per year. Ann is going to pay more. You are going to pay more. People with jobs will pay more. That's why she's so popular with women with needs, but not so popular with women with jobs. Hillary's first effort to socialize health care came in 1993 during her husband's first term. Widely perceived as a disaster, many say it provoked the Republican Revolution. I mean, certainly you have to ask whether or not she's learned a lot from that experience. It was a failure. She knows it was a failure. It was a very embarrassing failure for her. Where have you seen the government make anything more efficient and less costly and more effective by its presence. Where have you seen that? As I've said on many occasions, I still have the scars to show from what we tried to do back uh, in the first two years of Bill's administration. The effort to kill Hillary Care was really good common American sense. Americans uh, know a bad fish when they smell one. Everything Hillary wants for America is what Canada does for all of its people, any one of whom that has five extra bucks in their pocket comes across the border to the United States for health care services. I think it's worth remembering, uh, after her health care fiasco, the Clinton team put us aside. They gave us ceremonial duties thereafter. She was more like a Pat Nixon than she was like an Eleanor Roosevelt from mid-94 onward because Bill Clinton's professionals recognized she'd made a hash of the one big policy she'd been given. She was essentially out of the White House in 95, 96, and I know because I was there most of that time. She was visiting China. She went to 70 foreign countries. She wrote a best-selling book, did book signings. Then when the Lewinsky scandal broke, she came back to Washington and in 98 and 99 led the effort to keep her husband in office and in 99 and 2000 spent her time running for the Senate in New York. Many Americans believe our health care system needs improvement, but what is Hillary's solution? Hillary is really the closest thing we have in America to a European socialist. She really believes that government should vastly expand its efforts in the areas of health care and education, and she wants to increase taxes to do it, from 33% as it is now, up into the mid-40s and high-40s as it is in France and Germany. I'm going to take $10 billion away from a lot of these uh, industries, starting with money from the HMOs that are getting too much out of Medicare, starting with the no-bid contracts for Halliburton, starting with the defense industry that needs to be pared down and reined in. I've been very clear about that. And as she talks on the campaign trail, um, her purpose of government, as she sees it, is to remold society for the common good. The common good in this case means government. It means Washington. She wants government to be in control. She wants government to direct the economy. The other day, the oil companies reported the highest profits in the history of the world. I want to take those profits 
and I want to put them into a strategic energy fund. She expects to use the government uh, to, to become extremely involved with the lives of the people in this country because government knows best. So when she talks about nationalizing health care, she's not kidding. She's been at this now for 10 years. She wants to take over the health care system. What might Hillary's health care plan look like? Welcome to Yuma, Arizona. In my practice, about 70% of the care is paid for by Medicare, federal government, and another 20% is paid for by the state. So essentially, we're a very socialized medical community here. But with so much free health care available from the state and federal government, abuses are inevitable. One of my favorites is a patient of mine who was actually a drug runner. His books didn't tally, and to teach him a lesson, they blew a hole in his foot with a shotgun down in Mexico. Well, he went to the closest medical hospital in Mexico where medical care was free, and they were going to amputate his foot. So he popped up to the border, literally, and at that point demanded an ambulance, which by our emergency medical laws we have to supply. So we got an ambulance to him, we brought him to our emergency room. I asked him, I said, let me guess, this guy's insured, right? And, and uh, my friend said, oh, actually, he has Medicare. This guy's been wanted for years on four federal warrants. We're giving him his Social Security check every two weeks. Critics say Hillary's health care overhaul is not unlike what citizens of Canada or the UK now experience. Yes, much of it is free, but is there a catch? The waiting lists get longer and longer. You can wait six months to see a specialist. That's socialism. When you're standing in a line waiting and waiting, that's socialism. I'm thrilled that uh, universal health care is back on the national agenda. You know, as we remember back in 93 and 94, we tried to come forward with the plan. We weren't successful. I have the scars to show for that experience. Medicine should be between one physician and the patient not between an army of bureaucrats and the patient. If people give their health to the government, what does the government not control? The federal government from 3,000 miles away is not your doctor. Hillary's health care is one of the few Clinton campaign platforms that contains specifics. But on other issues important to Americans, what does she believe? But on specific issues, I've come out with very specific plans. With respect to Social Security, I do have a plan. But personally, I am not going to be advocating any specific fix until I am seriously approaching fiscal responsibility. Do you, the New York Senator, Hillary Clinton, support the New York governor's plan to give illegal immigrants a driver's license? I did not say that it should be done, but I certainly recognize why Governor Spitzer is trying to do it. No, no, no. You said, you said yes. No. You thought it made sense to do it. No, I didn't, Chris. It makes a lot of sense. What is the governor supposed to do? Do I think this is the best thing for any governor to do? No. Obviously, she hadn't been coached on. And if she's not coached, she's, uh, despite the fact that she's intelligent, she is so uh, insecure uh, and so uh, loathes the give and take of real politics that she just seizes up. And she sure seized up when those questions were asked her. Now, finally, for the first time, everyone talks about, well, Hillary talks about how, oh, they were so mean to her, they were so mean to her. All that happened in that debate was that, I think it was Tim Russert in that debate, engaged in the old journalistic practice of the follow-up question. That's all, that's all it took, and, you know, all <laughs> hell breaks loose because Hillary's asked to actually tell us what your position is. You know, it raises the question, uh, can you withstand the criticism in the way that any president has to? Uh, because there's going to be a lot of it for any president at any time, even the most propitious times. And uh, if you're going you're gonna to whine about people complaining about you, that doesn't suggest uh, presidential stature or character. I can support the president. I can support an action against Saddam Hussein because I think it's in the long-term interests of our uh, national security. If I had been president in 2003, I never would have started this war. And if it is still going on when I am president in 2009, I will end it. I was one who supported giving President Bush the authority if necessary, to use force against Saddam Hussein. I believe that that was the right vote. If I had been president in October of 2002, I would have never asked for 
authority to divert our attention from Afghanistan to Iraq, and I certainly would never have started this war. So it is with conviction that I support this resolution as being in the best interests of our nation, and it is a vote that says clearly to Saddam Hussein, this is your last chance. Disarm or be disarmed. I stand for ending the war in Iraq, bringing our troops home. We're going to have troops remaining there guarding our embassy. We may have a continuing training mission, and we may have a mission against al-Qaeda in Iraq. There's one Hillary who says, I'm going to bring the troops home right away when I'm elected president. Another Hillary who says, I'm going to keep troops in Iraq indefinitely. One of these two women is lying. I think she did that as long as she thought that it was still politically advantageous to support the war effort. Once 2006 kicked in and the war became quite unpopular, at least for a while, uh, then she started moving to the anti-war position, reversing her positions which she held only months before. Not because uh, her heart uh, was full of, uh, of uh, pacifistic leftist, leftist tendencies, because she thought it was the politically expedient way to go. Flip-flopping on a driver's license is one thing, but words do matter, particularly when they impact the lives of our soldiers and their families. He loved being a Marine. He looked me square in the eye and he just said to me, he said, Dad, He said, uh, Dad, what could be better, what could be more honorable than to serve your country? Uh, it was at that point where uh, he became my hero. In January of 2007, Senator Clinton visited Iraq. While there, she did an interview with ABC News stating, I don't know that the American people or the Congress at this point believe this mission can work. And in the absence of a commitment that is backed up by actions from the Iraqi government, why should we believe it? Because I was in Baghdad at that time, and we talked about that. I'm thinking, what the heck goes through the minds of our military that are out on those front lines, the Ramadi, the Fallujahs, out walking the streets of Baghdad, Hadifas, and, and throughout Iraq, putting their life on the line every single day and hearing something like that. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just so demoralizing. Robert Buzz Patterson served as the president's senior military aide in the Clinton White House. Distinguished service in the Air Force, including combat missions, and his regular interaction with the First Lady gave him unique insight about the potential future commander-in-chief. They see that when Mrs. Clinton says something stupid about the war, or Harry Reid says the war is lost, or Dick Durbin calls them uh, war criminals, uh, that is played immediately on Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya overseas. That does nothing to support the troops. Uh, all it does is embolden the enemy to believe if they can hang out a little bit longer, they win. It's very hard to believe her, because you don't know what the next day she's going to say, and, you know, that. It's terrible. Everybody from a four-star general to, the, to a private understands what it means to be a leader, what it means to have moral backbone and, and discipline and integrity. And the military saw uh, none of that during the 1990s and does not see that any of those uh, attributes in Mrs. Clinton today. If we do pull out and we do not complete this mission, my son's sacrifice would have been in vain, along with the other fallen heroes. If, if a legislator does not like the war and decides enough already with this war, then cut off the money. They're entitled to do that. But above all, it's not up to a legislator to try to outguess uh, military strategists. That's not their job. So you say again, okay, well, she's flipping, she's flopping. No, she's not flipping and flopping. She is lying. She will not take responsibility for calling and asking our good, brave soldiers to put their life on the line. She will not take responsibility. Every Democratic candidate, they all want to just get out of Iraq, just whatever it takes. When the fact of the matter is that you can't have good security in Iraq until you've dealt with, at a minimum, Syria and Iran because they're the ones who are arming, training, and running a lot of these terrorists. 
The war on terror isn't the only issue where Hillary is trying to have it both ways. When it's politically expedient, Hillary campaigns on her husband's presidency. But when the polls say otherwise, she abandons their record. But she can be as selective in terms of you know, cherry picking and making determinations uh, that she's now suddenly the face of foreign policy, that she you know, shaped economic policy, except for the stuff that didn't work out. Uh, in which case, that was somebody else's problem or somebody else's fault. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard uh, a stunning illustration of my real campaign slogan. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> this is as much about Bill Clinton as it is Hillary Clinton. I mean, for purposes of this election, it's one and the same. Buzz Patterson carried the nuclear football for President Clinton. While serving in the Clinton White House, he learned firsthand about the former First Lady's qualifications. When she was moving them around the White House hallways and corridors, the, the edict was for us to avoid eye contact with her so as to preclude her from making exchanges like good morning, good afternoon, and therefore the, those of us that worked in and around herself and her husband would oftentimes dive into open office, uh, office ways or doorways to avoid her stare. Well, I saw her vent on her husband many, many times. In one particular situation, we were at a fundraiser. As we entered the uh, elevator to go to the top floor of this hotel, her Mrs. Clinton lit into her husband with every profane, four-letter word you've ever heard in your life, and as, as a military guy, I've heard them all. The anger really took me by surprise, how vicious it was and how profane it was, and then, of course, we got to the top floor of the elevator, uh, of the hotel, and the elevator opened. They were holding hands and smiling and waving like uh, they, they, could, they could turn it on and off in a heartbeat. Both Clintons are well aware the war on terror could be the key issue in Hillary's run for the presidency. Both have been quick to fault the Bush administration for failing to prevent the 9-11 attacks, while absolving the Clinton White House of any missed opportunities. There were many times, eight to ten that I'm aware of uh, in the 1990s, that we had a chance as a country to, to capture bin Laden or to kill him, eight to ten, and every, every time we had a viable opportunity, uh, Clinton chose not to pull the trigger. You know, and I'm certain that if my husband and his national security team had been shown a classified report entitled Bin Laden Determined to Attack Inside the United States, he would have taken it more seriously than history suggests it was taken by our current president and his national security team. Patterson says that's laughable. He says President Clinton was briefed by multiple U.S. intelligence agencies of al-Qaeda plans to attack the United States. We knew about the potential for the Nick specifically pointed to the possibility of using hijacked airliners into the Pentagon, CIA headquarters, and it also talked about New York City. Cyrus Narasta is the award-winning writer-producer of the ABC miniseries The Path to 9-11. Though his movie takes aim at both the Clinton and Bush administrations in the days and years prior to 9-11, Narasta says he and his film were targeted by the Clinton machine. There was a huge coordinated campaign to discredit the movie and me and get Disney ABC to pull or recut the movie. In the weeks just prior to air, Narasta's home address and email were posted on various pro-Clinton websites. I got death threats at my house. I got hate mail. And they set about basically trying to destroy us and stop this thing from airing. Intimidation included five senators, led by Harry Reid, sending a letter to Disney ABC threatening to revoke their station licenses if they didn't pull or recut the movie. You gotta understand, these phone calls, the threats on the internet, these bloggers, all of these people out there, none of them had seen the movie. This was all political spin, and it was generated by ex-president Clinton from his offices in Harlem where he met with all of these bloggers to specifically discuss countermeasures uh, against the ABC broadcast, the path to 9-11, and how they could get it pulled from the air. Disney ended up cutting about three minutes from the over five hours of the broadcast. So I'm gonna show that to you now. They have the compound surrounded. They Same know page. where bin Laden is. Mr. Berger, is this and what speaking? they need to do Can is coordinate with to Washington. Alex? So they're on satellite uh, phone communication with Sandy Berger, 
Richard Clark, George Tenet, et al. from Washington to basically get the final green light to go ahead with this operation. Our people are in place. Now it's been confirmed that Osama bin Laden is in the building on the site. You are the national security advisor. Can't you give the order? Look, George, if you feel confident, you can present your recommendation to the president yourself. So if it all goes bad, it comes down on my head, like Janet Reno and Waco. The buck stops down the hall. <laughs> Mr. Berger, sir. Unbelievable. Did they abort us? Yes. It's shocking that ABC would, would bow down to Bill Clinton on the path to 9-11. Um, it's shocking that Bill Clinton would ask. You can't imagine Walter Mondale doing that. I don't even think you could imagine Jimmy Carter doing that. President Clinton has said he never got that close to getting Osama bin Laden. But national security experts have said on the record that the path to 9-11 was accurate. The path to 9-11 got it right. That's why they were ups upset. We exposed uh, the hot button truth that they've been trying to bury for years. The $40 million project was a rating smash with nearly 28 million viewers. It later received seven Emmy nominations. But if you want to catch The Path to 9-11 on DVD, you can't. ABC Disney won't release it. Why would they pass up millions of dollars in DVD revenue? I think the initial attacks were really about uh, President Clinton's legacy. However, now, a year later, with the DVD being suppressed, I think it has become about Hillary's run for the White House. All I can say is uh, what the exec at ABC told me, which is if Hillary wasn't running, this wouldn't be a problem. Hi, Mr. Berger. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. I have just a brief statement. Last year when I was in the archives reviewing documents, I made an honest mistake. It is one that I deeply regret. Former Clinton National Security Advisor Sandy Berger pled guilty to stealing and destroying highly classified documents from the National Archives and lying to investigators. I might say it seems Sandy walked out of the National Archives with some PBDs in his BVDs and some classified docs in his socks. I was surprised and astonished uh, when I learned that he had taken documents out of the National Archives, stuffed them in his socks, uh, I have written that the only reason Berger might have done this was at the behest of Bill Clinton or someone of similar stature who wanted information or, you know, single copies of unique copies removed from the archives. The papers reportedly revealed Clinton's response regarding the Millennium bomb plot and Sudan's offer to turn over bin Laden in 1996. But because Sandy Berger destroyed these critical secret documents, the American people may never know the truth about these events or the Clinton administration and 9-11. The documents that he stole pertain specifically to the sequence in the miniseries that they were upset about. I believe they are criminally guilty of distorting history. There was a smoking gun in there in terms of what the Clinton administration knew about bin Laden. Sandy Berger had a mission. That mission was to go in and clean up history, clean up mistakes, destroy any evidence of uh, error uh, or culpability to uh, actions that led to 9-11. He accomplished that. He b basically paved the way for her to move forward and give Bill a free pass. I mean, it's that simple. Sandy Berger was fined, lost his security clearance for three years, and was disgraced, especially in Washington. But he has resurfaced. Reportedly, Berger is now an advisor to the presidential campaign of Hillary Rodham Clinton. It's either that he's really good at foreign policy, which I doubt, or he knows something, <laughs> or they owe him. And I think that's what it is. Do I think uh, he should be advising Hillary Clinton? I think he's a perfect candidate to advise Hillary Clinton. He's sleazy, he broke the law, he will do her bidding. Uh, he should be her chief of staff, as a matter of fact.
Hillary is tough on terror as long as it's popular. But once again, the real Hillary Clinton remains a mystery. We went through all the speeches that were posted on her website, some 200 of them, and there's no speech that's about counterterrorism or talks about the threat to the homeland. Whatever Mrs. Clinton took away from the 9-11 experience is now slipping away. Or perhaps she never meant it in the first place. But as far as I know, Senator Clinton simply has not wanted to discuss with clarity and certainly with uh, the kind of authority you would expect from a now senior member of the Senate Armed Services Committee that we are at war with a totalitarian ideology. I'd like to see a president in either party uh, who is going to be honest about the nature of the danger and willing to stand up and say this is what needs to be done even if it's not popular at the moment. She doesn't seem to have any instinct to be able to do that, whatever her high intelligence might be. Who is the real Hillary Clinton? Clinton scholars and writers hoping for an answer were shocked to learn that, despite Freedom of Information Act stipulations, after three years, the Clinton Library has only released one half of one percent of its records. This is the mentality of a tyranny, and yet the media treats this as if it's no big deal. It is a very, very big deal. We paid for those documents at that library. Much of our money goes into that library. It's a federally run operation. The Clinton Library is known locally as Little Rock's Fort Knox. Nearly two million pages of records covering Hillary's years in the White House are locked away, clouding her role in policymaking. Over 300 Freedom of Information Act requests are pending. Well, that's not my decision to make, and I don't believe that any president or first lady ever has, but certainly we'll move as quickly as our circumstances and the processes of the National Archives permits. This idea they're claiming now that, that um, oh, we're, we're trying to release them, we're trying to as fast as we can, but, but the library just won't let us release them. You want the papers released, order the papers released. They're your papers. A tendency of this administration from the top all the way to the bottom is to withhold information, to resist legitimate requests for information, to refuse to be forthcoming about information that is of significance and relevant to the jobs that all of you do and the interests of the American people. I think the American people have a right to as much of the public record as possible about Hillary Clinton. Those records should be released before the 2008 election so we can learn a lot more about exactly how much influence she had in the White House, what her positions were in the White House, and how she acted in the White House. Character is defined as what we do when we think no one is looking. By that standard, many critics say the Clintons are sorely lacking. On January 20, 2001, President Clinton issued 140 pardons on his last day in office. Those pardoned or receiving commuted sentences included cocaine trafficker Carlos Vignali and the biggest tax fugitive in U.S. history, Mark Rich. As much as those pardons reveal about Bill, an earlier pardon may have revealed even more about Hillary's character and her willingness to do anything to get elected. I remember the first Met game my dad took me to, and we were sitting at the very top of Shea Stadium. It was probably 1971. It was just a beautiful day out with, with my dad. You know, he loved the Mets. He loved his sports. That's one thing that I'll never forget, is sort of being in the car with him and being at the game with him, just enjoying his presence. It was an idyllic childhood, to be honest with you. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better childhood up until I was nine. My dad was a very decent, honest family man. As a matter of fact, on that day, January 24th, he was looking forward to coming home that Friday, celebrating my brother's 11th and my 9th birthdays. It was going to be a big family event for us. Francis Tavern has an extraordinary place in American history. It's where the Sons of Liberty met. It's where George Washington bid farewell to his officers at the end of the Revolutionary War. And it's also the place where Frank Connor, my father, was murdered in 1975.
On January 24th, 1975, I was working as surveillance on the west side of Manhattan and the sirens started to go off. Just an endless stream of fire trucks, police vehicles going down to the southern end of Manhattan. A short time later, turning on a radio, easy to find out that there had been a bombing at Francis Tavern. Nobody dreamt that this was a daytime bombing of a restaurant in New York City in the United States of America because it simply was not the sort of thing that happened in America. The senseless bombing had been perpetrated by what was arguably the most active terrorist organization in U.S. history, the FALN. But in 1975, the FALN was a newly formed, previously unheard of organization that through deadly violence advocated complete independence for Puerto Rico. I kept hoping and thinking that maybe he's under rubble trying to get through and there's a mistake. It really didn't happen, that he was okay. My mom says now that all she wanted to do was run. She wanted to run out the door and keep running. I remember I was a little tiny nine-year-old and I was one of the guys that picked me up and I was sort of punching him in the back, not knowing what, how to react to something like that. Joe, this is the Bissell dining room at Francis Tavern. And this is the room that suffered most of the damage in the bombing on January 24th, 1975. The bomb was placed actually just on the opposite side of these doors. Waiters and some of the other witnesses remember seeing somebody come through this door carrying a large duffel bag. Uh, he looked around the room. One of the waiters was about to approach him and tell him to, that he had to leave when he stepped back out apparently left the bomb outside. This was a typical FALN device. It was a quantity of dynamite, right. included propane tanks, which was one of their trademarks in building their bombs in the early days, and a simple timer, a wristwatch, altered to serve as a timer to set off the device. So he knew when he placed it that essentially the people that he was that he had seen were going to feel the impact of Absolutely. He knew that he was committing mass mur murder, no question about it. Where, where would my dad have been sitting in relation to this table? I believe your dad was sitting at the end of the table here, Joe, uh, and would have been one of the first people hit by the blast of the bomb. Joe, the bomb being just outside this door here, when it functioned, much of the blast came of course, threw into this room, knocking down this door, and that shock wave would have taken everything in the room and just made missiles out of it. So you have victims that have pieces of glassware, pieces of silverware pushed into their bodies as a result of the blast. Do we know why they chose the time, the place, the day? The communique that they left said that they were trying to kill capitalist, imperialist pigs in Francis Tavern, and specifically cites Francis as being the target. Four died, and more than 50 were injured. It was a typical FALN operation, one of over 130 bombings between 1974 and 1983. But on that crisp winter day at Francis Tavern, no one could imagine what the future held for the murderous members of the FALN. Hillary's biggest problem running for the Senate was that she wasn't a New Yorker. And how is she going to appeal to the specific ethnic groups that make up the New York State electorate? So, in September 1999, right in the middle of her Senate campaign, she was approached by City Councilman Jose Rivera, who really is a spokesman for the Hispanic community in New York who gave her a packet urging the pardoning of the FALN terrorists. And included in the packet was a letter to Hillary asking her to use her influence on her husband to get these pardons granted. And two days later, they were. Freedom came today for most of the 14 Puerto Ricans who accepted President Clinton's controversial gift of clemency. Eleven of them, who describe themselves as nationalists, some others describe them as terrorists, were released from federal prisons around the country. It made no sense. Not one of the incarcerated FALN terrorists had requested clemency or had expressed any remorse. In fact, 
Prior to that action, the Clinton administration had granted clemency in just three cases out of over 3,000 applications, according to the Office of the Pardon Attorney at the Justice Department. It was putting a political agenda of the Clintons above my father's life. Sandy Berger appeared on television a day or two after the pardons were granted or after the clemency was granted and stated that these people were not personally involved in violence. That's simply not the fact. In this case, these people were convicted of planting 36 bombs in Chicago. If that's nonviolence, then Mr. Berger's dictionary is a little bit different than mine is. The Department of Justice uh, received a memo from the FBI saying that under no circumstances should these people be released. The President of the United States, who had access to all this information, ignored the facts of the matter. You have to ask yourself, who benefited from this besides the terrorists themselves? It's my view that have concluded the only other person that could have benefited from this was Hillary Clinton. The Senate, on a 95 to 2 vote, later denounced President Clinton's FALN clemency. Candidate Clinton claims she is the most experienced. Her husband claimed she was intimately involved in his administration. And yet, Hillary said publicly she had, quote, no involvement in or prior knowledge of the decision. Obviously, she knew about it. Obviously, she asked Bill to do the pardons. And obviously, when she says she knows nothing about it, she's not telling the truth. How dare they? Um, my father was a decent, honest um, family man. And he was being forgotten or used a, as a political pawn by those people who didn't have his decency, didn't have his family values, and wasn't the kind of man that my father was. We've had only two father-son presidencies in the history of our nation. We may be on the verge of the first husband and wife commander-in-chiefs. Historically, Americans have never been keen on dynasties. So it's worth remembering that a vote for Hillary is a vote to continue 20 years of a Bush or a Clinton in the White House. American people deserve to know that their presidency is not for sale, the Lincoln bedroom is not for rent, and lobbyist money can no longer influence policy in the House or the Senate. The problem with nostalgia is what we tend to do is you only remember what you like and you right, and you forget the parts that you didn't like. So what John Edwards is saying uh, about outmoded thinking and nostalgia is really I think expressing um, a reluctance to turn American democracy which is very I think meritocratic over to two families and Hillary Clinton would represent the past in that and a continuation of I think a dangerous trend to electing people because of uh, how much recognition they have rather than their intrinsic qualities. Finally, before America decides on our next president, voters should need no reminders of what's at stake, the well-being and prosperity of our nation. We uncovered a radio show that Eleanor Roosevelt, her heroine, did in 1934. Eleanor Roosevelt was asked during the show, when will a woman become president? Her answer, when a majority of the American people have trust and confidence in the integrity of her. And that's the challenge that Hillary faces. It's been said, and I agree with it, that this is the most personal political choice that Americans make. We're very interested in their personality traits, their person that they could trust, that they would like. That's where I think Hillary Clinton as a candidate has great defects. She's not accountable. She'll never be accountable personally for anything that she does. And her personality is such that she believes that the end justifies the means no matter what uh, those means are. If she weren't married to Bill Clinton, what is there that she has accomplished in her life that would lead you to believe that she should become the most powerful person in the country. Which candidate is most likely to be able to be successful in protecting us from the threat from radical Islam? That is the central crisis of our time. 
If she reverts to form, Hillary Clinton will likely be in the future what she has been in the past, which is a person, a woman, a politician of the left. And I don't think that's going to be good for the security of the United States. She can't favor. English is the official language of government, has said she can't favor it. Eighty-five percent of the American people favor English as the official language of government. I think there are a number of big issues where you'd have a very clear contrast. She favors liberal judges. Ninety-one percent of the American people favor the right to say one nation under God. The bigger this campaign is, the bigger the choice is, the more trouble she's in. What will be important, though, and this is some baggage she has to deal with, is the idea of a co-presidency, the idea that Bill Clinton will be back in the White House. Because I think when he left the White House, people had had enough. I can't imagine that Americans want to go back to, to the 90s and the country being dragged into this, this ugly, dysfunctional family drama. I certainly don't see Hillary Clinton as someone who can unify the country. Uh, President Bush didn't. I don't think she would either. I think that we're at a very critical time in this country uh, that requires leadership. And uh, I can tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that uh, Hillary Clinton that I know is not equipped, not qualified to be our Commander-in-Chief. This vote comes down to one thing, liberty. Do you believe in liberty or don't you? Economic liberty, free speech, protecting our borders, uh, protecting our country from terrorism. The issue is liberty. You know, on January 20th, 2009, someone will stand on the steps of the Capitol and raise his or her hand to take the oath of office. As the 44th President of the United States of America. We must never underestimate this woman. We must never understate her chances of winning. We mustn't be lulled into a state of security and complacency by the newfound moderation that she likes to talk about. And we must never forget the fundamental danger that this woman poses to every value that we hold dear. You see, I know her. <laughs>